Yeah, welcome everybody to our Munich AI lectures. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome today Max Welling. He's a full professor and research chair in machine learning at the University of Amsterdam. And he's also a distinguished scientist at Microsoft Research, where he uh, quite recently actually established a new lab in Amsterdam, mainly focusing on uh, AI for the sciences. And he has a perfect background for this research theme. He's not only an expert in machine learning, computer science, but he also uh, studied and did his PhD in theoretical high energy physics. So really a perfect fit for the topic we will talk today about, which is the PDE prior. Max, you are very welcome to share your screen and yeah, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go full screen. And I hope everybody can see it. Yes, perfect, we can see it. Let's see if we can get, no, oh, I need to get my laser pointer. Yeah, there we go. All right, so yeah, I'm super happy to be here and uh, talk to you about um, some something I'm really excited about. Um, so it it is a, about the PDE prior, but I renamed it to a new paradigm for scientific discovery. So the first part of my talk will be about uh, a new paradigm for scientific discovery. And indeed, um, I have, uh, you know, four days a week, um, I'm now working at Microsoft Research in Amsterdam, where we opened a new group um, on, you know, applying deep learning to uh, the sciences. So in this particular talk, um, I'll talk uh, very quickly about deep learning, um, and then I'll talk about AI for science, uh, basically about molecules and PDE solvers, and then I'll talk about science for AI, which is this, uh, this idea of a PDE prior, and uh, then I'll conclude hopefully everything within 30 minutes. Okay, so um, maybe um, you've all noticed, but uh, you know, deep learning has been transforming the field of, well, natural language processing, um, like speech recognition, uh, but also computer vision, uh, like image uh, you know, recognition or object recognition and images. And it's gone on uh, to explain jokes to us. And of course, with the latest uh, deep learning tools, we can now sort of type a prompt, a sentence, um, and we get some fairly creative images. And, and these days, even videos um, about you know, visualizing um, what we uh, sort of put in the text. Uh, these things keep amazing me. Um, and, and most of this, I mean, this is actually not entirely true. Of course, the workhorse of what's happening is often uh, transformers. Um, this is a convolutional neural network. I will not go into many details of that. Um, much of my own work and much of the work that is relevant for um, the things I'll be talking about are actually a special case of a uh, convolutional neural network, um, which is a, uh, a message passing algorithm. You could call it special case. You could also call it a sort of more general uh, sort of version of it. And in fact, a transformer can be seen as a message passing algorithm. So all, all of these things are related, but it's, it's perhaps interesting to think about a convolutional neural network where sort of you take a particular filter and you slide it over an image um, and then you add the results up and so you store it at the next layer. You can think of that actually as a message passing algorithm where you have, let's say a vector of uh, sort of values, let's say on this corner here of the, of the uh, filter maps, that's a, that's a vector living here on this particular node. And these are all multiplied by matrices and then sent to the central node and then added up. And also you can also send a message to yourself. So that's a, that's a, a message passing algorithm, but where every neighbor can send a different message using a different matrix. Now in graph convolutional networks, the situation is a little bit more chaotic in the sense that the number of neighbors can change and the order of the neighbors can change. And so one very simple idea is to just use the same matrix for each one of the neighbors. But this is one of the simplest message passing algorithms, um, the graph convolutional neural network, and many more far more sophisticated versions have been introduced after that. So my own work and work of, of many of the students and postdocs I've been working with is to turn that into something that's useful for molecules. Um, and that's an equivariant graph convolution. So um, equivariant, because if you rotate or translate uh, the particular graph, um, but you still give it the same inputs, the network doesn't get confused about the fact that you just have changed these 
perspective orientation of your reference frame. It will do exactly the same. And what you see here is on the nodes, there's representations of so-called spherical harmonics. Doesn't matter what that is. It's basically a representation of its state. And as we go through the layers of the neural network, it processes, you know, uh, the information at the input and sends messages, you know, between the nodes. And so these states change. And at the end, it will make a prediction about, let's say, you know, uh, the property of the entire molecule, or perhaps like a property of an atom. Um, and so that's the core technology. Um, and versions of this um, have been used already um, in, for instance, protein folding, uh, which was something like a, um, an uh, equivariant transformer um, that would predict, just from the amino acid sequence, it would predict the three-dimensional shape of the protein. Uh, in our own work here, um, we have used equivariant graph neural networks to generate molecules from a certain distribution. So let's say a distribution of, of, of a particular you know, distribution of molecules. And then the question is, you just start with some random noise with some uh, random uh, actually atom of certain types, and you use diffusion algorithms, which is the same algorithms which are currently so popular for generating images, et cetera, and videos. Um, to actually build a sort of stable, thermodynamically stable um, molecule in an arbitrary rotation, or so it doesn't really care about the rotation. And of course, uh, there's also other ways in which machine learning gets applied to the sciences. And this is a very cool piece of work from DeepMind where they use reinforcement learning to control a plasma in a tokamak nuclear fusion reactor. Um, so, the, um, so it's interesting that sort of machine learning and deep learning has been revolutionizing this you know, natural language processing and computer vision um, and, and a number of other fields. Um, I, I believe my bet is actually that um, it will revolutionize the sciences um, in the next decade. And of course the sciences is like, it's like a huge field, right? right? There is, you know, applications, there's science happening at the femtosecond scale and the picometer scale uh, where you study, where at CERN, for instance, they study the collisions of, of elementary particles you know, all the way up to molecules and, and plasmas and then fluids and then geophysics at the scale of the, of the earth. And then of course, uh, astrophysics at, at the scale of, of galaxies and the universe itself. There's an in, insane sort of scale difference between elementary particles and um, and uh, sort of the, the applications in astrophysics. Um, so, so we actually at Microsoft we we focus on this part. So we focus on on simulating molecules and and plasmas and fluid mechanics. So this part here is currently our uh, main interest. And and the first uh, sort of core area in which we are investing and which we're studying is this area of partial differential equations. And what's kind of interesting to me is that it in in machine learning. We, we don't much learn about partial differential equations, right? We, we, we use SVMs and we use deep learning and we use your graphical models and whatever tools we have. Um, but I would almost say that the rest of the natural sciences um, that I share a building with, everybody uses partial differential equations to express their model. Um, you know, as soon as something is continuous and, and, um, and causal, um, and local, you basically have have a PDE, and it's again this 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 PDE framework is extremely broad, um, going from earthquakes to you know to uh, health to weather prediction to galaxy predictions to plasma physics, airplane design, electronic structure prediction, you know, of a molecule, the electronic structure around a molecule, to tumor development, and and many many more applications. And what we have been seeing lately, and you know, uh, we have also been working on that um, um, among, with other groups as well, is that you know there is a there's a whole field in mathematics where people solve these PDEs with with numerical methods, and what we're seeing now is that people are starting to apply deep learning to solve these PDEs, um, and um, this is a very fast developing field. Um, of course, you know it's it. it it's, it comes with less uh, sort of uh, guarantees, but it's, it certainly can speed up uh, sort of the prediction of the, of the solution of a PDE. So here, here you see basically 
you know, a PDE over pressure and, and velocity fields to predict, let's say, the weather. Um, this is a more sophisticated and bigger model from NVIDIA, where sort of you have sort of global weather prediction um, and uh, sort of there's two, so here's, here's an inset of, you know, this particular piece. And then they show that where, you know, 96 hours into the future, the, the prediction of the forecast net is, is, is here and it predicts these storms where in the truth, which is kind of fun because you always, the truth will always come at, um, at some point. And so you can compare it to the truth and you can see that, you know, it's pretty accurate. So, so that's a fast developing field, which I find very interesting. Another fast developing field is basically computational chemistry and using deep learning for computational chemistry. And the fascinating part here is that uh, basically everything is made of molecules. Now there is an at risk because of course, you know, there's also a few things which are not made of molecules like four fund fundamental forces like the electromagnetic force and gravity and strong and weak, weak nuclear forces. Um, you can also break a molecule up into smaller pieces. You can get a plasma or you can get, you know, quarks or leptons if you smash them into each other at CERN. Um, but mostly everything you can touch around you is made of molecules. And um, therefore, if you can control molecules um, and understand them, there's a huge area of applications uh, which opens up. Uh, in the most defined, the ones I find most most exciting are in health and environmental and climate uh, science. So for instance, uh, drug discovery and drug development, uh, where you try to fit, let's say, a small ligand molecule into a pocket of a protein, or photovoltaics, where you try to turn light into energy, or tribology, where you try to uh, reduce the friction between surfaces, and 20% and of all the uh, sort of waste of energy, in some sense, is, is going through friction. Um, and catalyst is, uh, is actually a very large part of our economies is uh, we using catalyst to produce all sorts of materials and, and liquids and all that kind of stuff. Um, and designing good catalysts to speed up these, these, uh, these uh, reactions um, is, is extremely important, for instance, for hydrogen production, but also for nitrogen fixation. Uh, which uh, fertilizers, which, which you need for uh, fertilizer production. And it's actually a very wasteful process. Um, and also in biology, of course, uh, molecules play a key role. Now, molecules do represent a huge opportunity for society. Um, and I, I just wanna say that I feel there's a convergence of different things, which makes this such an exciting field. So uh, there's the sciences, in, ter in particular condensed matter physics, computational chemistry, and molecular biology, which have advanced to a, to a very advanced level. Then there's the computational sciences, like uh, you know, HPC computation, machine learning, and quantum computing in the future, hopefully, that are uh, advancing very quickly. And then there is the applications which pool um, on these on these technologies, like applications in health and energy uh, transition and the sustainability applications. Um, and you could dream a little bit about what it would mean if you could really control and understand and simulate molecules. Um, just, you know, the, we, have, we have sort of named the ages of human development after the materials that we use, right? So from Stone Age to Bronze Age to Iron Age, now we are using steel and plastic and aluminum and, you know, what else do you have? But what if we could actually just design materials on demand? I say, I want a, I want a material with these properties created for me, right? And um, to what would happen then in some sense, right? There's a huge amount of uh, things that uh, open up. Um, and yeah, and, and so, in some sense, I feel um, in, in maybe 10 or 20 years, we might have a golden age of designing new materials and chemicals and catalysts and drugs, et cetera. Now, um, how do we study uh, molecules and how do we uh, sort of, you know, set, you know, go, go on this path, on this journey of trying to understand molecules better. Now, one way is to look at our fellow scientists, uh, the physicists and the astronomers, what did they do to advance the field? Well, they built huge microscopes, right? Um, so here on the left-hand side, there is the uh, Large Hadron Collider or one of these detectors actually that uh, that detects the particles as they collide you know, in the central beam here, and then they go into all of these, these sensors here. And the astronomers, they built like large radio telescope arrays, you know, actually distributed over the entire earth, uh, going from South Africa to Australia and then the Netherlands and Germany, there are all these antennas and they're all connected to be one big antenna. So what would that look like in computational chemistry? And 
Um, the idea is that we would build a computational microscope. So we will we will try to simulate these molecules at a very detailed level and 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 look at the, the various reactions and try to understand the reactions and you know and predict their properties um, by th through simulation basically. Um, so we've sort of called this the fifth paradigm of scientific discovery. And so the first paradigm is really trial and error. So you build your plane, um, you fly it. If it crashes, uh, you know, you didn't succeed. Um, you know, if you're still alive, you know, build the next one and try it again. Now, uh, later, um, people started to build models and started to test them in wind tunnels and collect a lot of data and using that data, try to improve sort of this design, you know, build another one, put it in a wind tunnel, et cetera. So you don't you don't actually have to fly it um, and crash it before before you can improve it. And even more recently, which you could call a fifth paradigm, is everything is being done in a computer. So you don't have to actually put anything in a wind tunnel anymore. There is a virtual wind tunnel um, where you can just put in your airplane, and it will it will do all the all the computations necessary to figure out you know how the how the how the the, the fluids flow around your wings, etc. Uh, of course, in our, on this path, uh, you need more and more computation because the computational complexity increases. And ver something very similar has happened in chemistry. So in the beginning, when you want a new material, you just try and see what comes out, um, and then you hope it sticks. Um, later, of course, you know people did lots of experiments, and they ana analyzed them, put them in databases, and you know tried, tried to you know, study the databases statistically and then try to come up with better designs of producing certain chemicals or catalysts or whatever. So nowadays we are seeing a transition to doing more and more of these calculations, what's called app initio, completely in silico in a computer. So you just you know, model an entire molecule and all their atoms and all the physics in order to do all the computations, basically all the phys simulate the physics inside your computer. Um, now, what's so hard about molecular simulation? It looks pretty simple if you if you if you think about it. There's a bunch of, you know, there's a graph with a bunch of atoms on it, right? And these atoms they have certain forces, you know, relative to each other. So you just go, you know, 17th century, you know, Newtonian mechanics. And you say, well, I know all the forces, and I know I, I know Newton mechanics, so I can move all the atoms forward. But there's two things which make this really hard. The first thing is that this is a very chaotic a set of equations. So it's quite hard to predict the future from the past because the equations are very nonlinear and very chaotic. The second thing is that even for a single step, in order to compute the forces that you need for Newtonian dynamics, in fact, you need quantum mechanics to compute the force. And the reason is that there's a whole cloud, let's say here, of electrons flying around all of these atoms and you can simply not treat them as classical objects. You have to treat them quantum mechanically. Quantum mechanics is exponentially difficult to compute you know, uh, quantities from. And so you'll have to do approximations or use a quantum computer or whatever. But even to compute a single step and a single force accurately is already very uh, computationally intensive. So in some sense, the, the, the universe is a much better computer than, than we can build. It's just a little hard to program, I guess. So um, now, it, it, just to, to, to show again, you know, the sheer you know, size of the problem. So here are two prize winning experiment, virtual experiments that people de did or in, in, you know, in silico experiments. Uh, one is around uh, coronavirus simulation with uh, 300 million atoms. And the other one um, is sort of more like a, sort of a solid simulation of a metal with 127 million atoms, but they all use around 27,000 GPUs to do these, these simulations of relatively small structures, right? Um, so very computationally intensive. So how is the fifth paradigm of scientific discovery going to improve on this? Uh, well, you might have guessed, uh, it's basically by saying that, you know, instead of actually computing these things through quantum mechanics, or actually evolving this through molecular dynamics, we're going to train a big uh, sort of neural network to try to either you know predict these forces on these atoms, which are called force fields, and these are actually already 
pretty well developed. And the other thing is, you know, trying to evolve forward the dynamics, you can also try using a neural network to predict the future state given a past state over much larger time steps than you can with molecular dynamics. And the good thing is that we're not throwing away data. So if, if you do a bunch of simulations, expensive simulations, you just share, you store that data and then you know update your models to become better and better, right? And so at some point they become so good that you can sort of throw away your expensive simulations, right? Um, and so we sort of envision a search engine for molecules, right? So you just type, you know, I need a molecule, you know, that does this and this and that with these properties. And then there's something happening in the background where, you know, molecules are generated, they get tested using neural networks for their properties, they get simulated, right? And then out pop, you know, a hundred molecules, which might have that uh, sort of the, the set of properties. And you can do this sort of forward. You can take, you can take molecules, you can do slow physical simulation, you can do fast neural network simulation, but even better is inverse design, which is you just give me the properties and I will just generate for you molecules, right? And that's sort of the, you know, the, the, the paradigm that we wanted to test here in this model. Others have done similar things. We will train a fully equivariant neural network um, based on uh, sort of these, uh, sort of these ideas that would sort of uh, generate these molecules like this. Okay, the, I'm running out of time. I have five minutes. So I'll just go quickly over this. Uh, so, so this is the, you know, the uh, science for AI part. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I've been very excited about is trying to build in inductive biases in our neural networks, which were inspired by physics. And one of them was symmetries. And uh, symmetries have been long known in physics. Uh, you know, for instance, Lorentz transformations between two moving observers you know, turn electric fields into magnetic fields, basically showing there are two sides of the same coin and acceleration and gravity turn, to turn out to be the same as well. So there's also a symmetry transformation between those two, which turn into general relativity. And in fact, the entire standard model of elementary particles is organized around symmetries. Um, so we, so we in, in particular, uh, Taco Cohen and later also Maras Weiler uh, have developed this theory um, around equivariant neural networks where uh, you can build these symmetries into your neural networks. So basically what it says in very simple terms, if you have input data, um, then there might be transformations in the world that should not change you know, the, the predictions that you want to make. Um, and so there's a transformation, it could be a rotation or something like that. And then there's an encoder which maps this to hidden activities or maybe even to, to labels. And we want, we want to find transformations in our hidden activations um, such that this diagram closes, right? If I first transform the world and then encode, it should be the same as first encode and then transform my hidden activations. If I, if I can make this happen, then at the output, basically the output predictions will, will be either invariant or transformed properly um, if I transform the input of my neural network. Um, and so you can apply this actually to reinforcement learning, where in reinforcement learning, you're basically the, the movements in the input are you know choosing an action and move according to that action. And then you can build latent representations where in the latent representation, you also take action and move. And um, Elisa has uh, sort of turned that into models where sort of you can, if you know the policy in one part of your state space or state action space, um, you can sort of use that, you know, the symmetry to transfer that policy to a policy, a policy for a symmetric state action pair uh, where you know precisely what to do, but sort of after a transformation that sort of cuts out half of your space. Um, so with Andy, I've worked on something that's quite slightly different. Um, so I start with an input data. Let's say I have some set of transformations of the world. I have an encoder and a decoder or an encoder in this direction. and then um, what, so we were thinking about, okay, what would be this dynamics in this hidden space? What would that look like? And, and we, we started to read papers in the sort of a neuroscience literature. And it turns out that people find that in the brain on the cortex, there's traveling waves that sort of represent sort of transformations of the sort of activations of the neurons. And we, try, we, we got inspired by that and tried to uh, sort of model the the, the, activa the activations that are happening in the brain as we describe it with a partial differential equation um, so that 
you know, it can model these transformations on the input space. And here I have a bunch of sort of illustrations of how that looked like. So here's a, here's the hit, these are the hidden activations differently uh, visualized of a rotating MNIST image. So you see, you know, they, they, they produce these beautiful traveling waves. Um, so here's a ball that's bouncing up and down is the ground truth, here's the reconstruction. And so you can see that the hidden activations now are sort of more like standing waves in this space, and uh, similar here um, and here, where here is of course more complex, so it needs more or higher frequencies to represent all of that. So I'm quite excited about this idea to take ideas from physics and put them back into our neural networks. Okay, so uh, to conclude, um, so um, I, I, as I said, I think the natural sciences are sort of the next field to be disrupted by deep learning. And I'm super excited uh, about that because we might see beautiful applications in health and sustainability coming out of that. And it's really something that we need to start focusing on given the fact that sort of we are, um, you know, the, the state of, you know, our, our uh, climate is, is fairly uh, dire in the sense that uh, the, the, the world is warming up and it's quite unclear what that would mean. So I would invite you um, to, you know, to, to join in this effort um, to try to, to do something uh, real with AI about this climate change. Um, but if you don't, you know, if, if that's not enough, I think there's also absolutely huge opportunities, ec economic opportunities coming out of this, uh, both in, in pharma and catalysis and, and new materials, and even in carbon capture, there will be whole new markets created around that. Um, and so also in that sense, it's a very um, sort of interesting and exciting field. And I'll stop there. I think I'm right on time. Excellent. Thank you, Max. A very nice presentation. To presentation. I would like to open the floor for the question and answer session. So for the people who are in the Zoom call, yeah, just raise your hand and turn on your video as Matthias just did. Um, so Matthias, I think you have a question. So just go for it. Yeah, I just wanted to know sort of, um, what sort of group actions you think are are really interesting and exploitable and or particularly challenging in this realm of imposing sort of equivariance on the estimators and, and, and prediction rules that you get out then? Yeah, so we've used um, mostly tr you know, translations, that's easy of course, and then uh, rotation so se3 is typically the group that we've been working with um, but um, in quantum mechanics uh, there's also other types of transformations there's gauge transformations um, so, so so you can also do uh, flips or mirroring transformations uh, so these are mostly geometric but as i said you, you can also do things which are more like gauge transformations um, which are more local uh, symmetries um, uh, but maybe the most exciting thing is not to, oh, scaling, by the way, we've also looked at scaling, uh, but maybe the most exciting thing is not to necessarily um, sort of define the, the set of transformations, but just leave it open to some degree and try to learn it from the data. So to put some, some structure in there that sort of, that sort of is like a group or a semi-group structure, and then let the data try to figure out, you know, what would be, you know, the representations. I think that's a that's a open, completely open problem. There's there's some papers that are trying to address this, um, and uh, so I think people are pretty good now at predicting, you know, abelian groups, um, but non-abelian groups like SO3 are very hard to just learn from data because there's also combinatorial structure there, which is hard to nail. Um, so, so we, we try to do something even more re relaxed, which is the PDE. So basically saying, well, I'm just going to say that the transformations in the hidden space should be, you know, local, um, continuous and causal. And then if, if, if something changes, it, it, should it should be described by some kind of PDE. And I'm happy to learn that PDE from the data, which is, which is you know, some kind of prior, the PDE prior that you put on the space. But I think, uh, I mean, the whole game is, of course, how much do you want to impose on your, on your space and how much do you want to keep free? That, that's the game we play when we do machine learning. Um, and you know, I feel that, uh, you know, that there's, there's still a huge amount of things that we can try. Other people use causality, for instance, where they say, I, I want things to be causal in my hidden space. And that's another prior. 
which I'm sure you know a lot more about than I do. Does okay. that answer the question, Sir? No. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Volker? Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Max. Uh, uh, fantastic talk. Um, so my camera doesn't work. Yeah, whatever. Um, uh, yeah, maybe a, a little bit down to earth uh, question. Um, uh, so, um, I mean, great team, great work. Uh, but why is why is Microsoft doing it? Uh, I mean, you guys probably also have shareholders uh, who want to know what where the money goes or something like that. Is there a good yeah. justification? I mean, whatever. That's probably a very good justification. But maybe you let us in. Yeah. No, there is, of course. I mean, uh, you know. Uh, Obviously, the CEO will not let us do this uh, and spend money on this if there's not a vision on, you know, monetizing this in the future. Um, as I said, there are huge economic, uh, there's huge economic potential in this field, um, and you should not forget that Microsoft is a platform company, so that we, we basically sell compute online, right? So uh, the more compute you are willing to do on our platform, uh, the happier we are. So we just want to build a fantastic. Uh, sort of platform uh, where if you are a chemist or a material scientist uh, and you need to do certain calculations, you know, that's the place to go. That's where you will do your calculations, right? And um, that, so, so we believe that in the future that there's going to be a big market there. Okay, great. Thanks. Vladimir? Uh, thank you for the nice talk. Um, by um, the learned equivariance, do you mean something like capsule networks or, or some different mechanism? So I don't know pre uh, precisely what the capsule network does, but um, it could, you know, so, so one thing I want to say is that capsules are very related to this, right? So um, you can think of sort of the irreducible representations that are sort of the subspaces which live in your hidden representation are sort of the spaces if you if you transform your input you get some sort of transformation inside that space and sort of every capsule has its own sort of transformation inside its space right um, where if you process through the layers you sort of mix the capsules together as well but if you do the, the, the symmetry transformation you stay within your sort of little capsule um, so if you put lots of you know if, if you basically completely nail the structure you're going to say there has to be an irre irreducible representation of my group or a regular representation of my group whatever you choose right and then you know there's nothing to learn um, you can also say well you know i want to put some structure and that could be you know i'm going to define some capsules some subspaces and i want that whenever i make symmetry transformation something happens inside this subspace and not across these subspaces and maybe i even want to encourage certain types of uh, sort of uh, behavior in there. So if I make a rotation in the input space, I should also make a full rotation, the sort of uh, capsule space, et cetera. So, um, so I don't know what the, what, what the particular technique that you mentioned does, but I, I could very well imagine that that's, that's something very similar. Um. By, so as far as I recall, when using reducible group representations, the output feature maps of a layer are defined on the group elements. If I'm not confusing with other group representations, would you then um, kind of leave that latent space kind of open and higher dimensional and then somehow say we want it to learn to use a lower dimensional subspace, which would then be the group and which would then have this some group structure that we learn. Is that kind of the idea of learning? Yeah, it, I think, I think the, so you're right that you sort of, uh, you now have to decide on the dimensionality of that space. Um, I mean- And on the structure. Um, yeah, the structure you could choose to learn. So you could say something like, I want to learn some kind of homomorphism. So I want, if I do things in my input space, right, I want that to be, you know, properly represented in my hidden space, right? So I think basically the, the picture that I showed where, you know, you have a transformation in your input space and then you map to your hidden space and then there needs to be something in that hidden space 
which follows this, which follows the same transformation. That's sort of a homomorphism of the input, right? You need to, you know, every combination of things at the input space need to re need to translate to analogous things in the hidden space so, so that you always close that diagram, always sort of, you can go around the diagram, it doesn't matter in which direction you go. I think that's that's just the minimal structure that you, I think, have to impose. Um, yeah, so, and now if, if you wanna help it, encourage it by giving it more structure then it might learn things easier, but at least this, this homomorphic map, I think is, is what you should demand. And you, but you can also demand it like softly, right? You could say something like, I'll just put a regularizer there, which tries to, you know, close the diagram if it doesn't really close. And then you sort of encourage it to, to become equivariant. But maybe if the world isn't all that symmetric, um, after all, uh, then maybe it doesn't have to completely be equivariant. If you impose it hard, in a hard way, would you say there's just one way to impose it in a hard way? Or also there, there might be several possibilities and none of them is like completely better than the others. Okay, so for um, so if it's a group, um, so you know then that you have to have a group representation. Um, now you can just look up for certain groups what are all the possible group representations. There's basically two ways. You can go for a regular representation, but that's sort of infinite dimensional. So then you'll have to, you know, discretize the group, and that actually works very well, I should say, in practice. Or you can go to irreducible representations. Now th those come in sort of finite subspaces, but then you still have to pick which ones, right? So for for SO3, you'll just have to pick, you know, maybe I want two subspaces, uh, two one-dimensional subspaces, L equals zero, and then I want two, you know, su three-dimensional subspaces, L equals one, and then I want one, you know, five-dimensional subspace. So, so that sort of combinatorial thing ha you have to pick. And then within those subspaces, you can sort of encourage that the things will sort of be, you know, representations of the input transformations. Thank you. Thank you. Since I don't see at the moment any further hands, I have a couple of questions, Max. Um, let me start with one question, which I've seen on your slide, where you said um, we have like a perfect setting where we have synthetic training data and perfectly labeled data. Right, um, ah. I, I don't remember which slide it was exactly. Yeah, yeah. And um, for the, yes, for the, yeah. this is this is only partially true, I would argue, right? Because the simulations we are doing, but right, they're also not perfect, right? So there is some error. Um, yeah. How you can comment on that, and how would you handle this? I mean, still an imperfect setting, I would say. Yeah, so that's that's a very good point. Um, so yeah, so basically there is a hierarchy of approximations. Um, that you can use in order to get your data. Um, it's, uh, for instance, for instance, for quantum mechanical simulations, you can do, you know, uh, coupled clustered calculations, which are n to the six or n to the seven or something very expensive, but very accurate. I mean, you can do, you can do act an exact calculation for very small systems, which is exponentially hard or exponentially expensive. Um, and then there's DFT calculations, which are more like, uh, I think, n cubed or something like that. So they're much more doable, but then of course you will introduce uh, sort of approximation. So I think the real way you want to treat this is as an agent which, re which reasons over, you know, what type of data it needs at every moment in time. So you basically, you're building your model, let's say a force field or a model for computing the forces on atoms. And you, your model is accurate, let's say, has a certain error bar accurate to a certain degree in this particular region of space. And then you ask, okay, this is not good enough for me. I need more accuracy. And so then you go to your Oracle, which is basically your quantum mechanical calculation. And you see, I, I, and then you say, I need sort of a label uh, with this particular accuracy for this force here at this point. So give it to me and then it will figure out, you know, you know which, which method to use in order to do that calculation and then you 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 move forward and you update your model basically so um yeah it will never be perfect or all there's always be some error but you know, sort of control over there's a sort of a trade-off between how much error you have and how much computation you invest in that particular computation i fully agree so um 
another question I have in general is like, I mean, you mentioned these different principles, right? We can use DMT, DFT, couple cluster. And I, I guess you also know all these works like these neural wave function approaches, so to say. Um, so what what you what is your personal opinion? Let's say how far can we go with these techniques? So because I mean, if we want to have like large molecules at the end of the day, right? Then yeah. I guess at the moment, at least, right, we cannot use a super uh, accurate uh, coupled cluster or neural wave function approach, right? Because yeah. it's too large. Uh, what is your personal opinion? How how big can we make this? Really, yeah, in the next uh, couple of years, let's say. Um, so I think really what we are doing is we are recycling simulations, and and that's it, right? So, so um, it we cannot get more accurate than the actual simulations, or perhaps the the experiments that we are doing, right? Um, now I don't, I, I find it very hard to predict, but but you you saw that you know. Uh, you know, I, I think right now people sort of can do molecular dynamics on a billion atoms or something like that. So pretty large, but of course, you know, that's not with the full quantum mechanical calculation for each atom. Um, so it's also a trade-off between how much accuracy do you want, right, in, in that calculation. And yeah, it, it will always be a fight in some sense because we never beat nature um, unless unless we can program nature. Um, you know, better than we currently do, which is basically doing an experiment. And of course, um, at some point in time, you know, a quantum computer might uh, might arrive. And then with a the quantum computer, you know, you know, it's also quite open how useful they will be. But at least the hope is that for quantum mechanical calculations, um, you can do you you can program it to to deliver data um, at a scale which is again better than what we can do classically on classical computers. Um, but, you know, if you sort of take Moore's law, you, you so there's two effects, right? There's Moore's law, which makes things better. And then there is recycling the data constantly, uh, which which basically we, we should build, we should really put a lot of effort in building huge databases of, of data and share it. And then, you know, everybody can build their huge models. And I think that would be very helpful. Thank you. I have a couple of more questions, but I would again ask the audience, are there any questions at the moment? Otherwise, I will just continue <laughs> with a few more. Okay, then one more. So at the very end, you have shown this, uh, the PDE and the latent space, right? Um, I'm, I'm wondering in, in general, so why are PDEs popular? To some degree, because they describe real uh, systems, so to say, the real world, how they really behave. Um, if we do this in the latent space, I'm always wondering, like, if we have like an encoder decoder at the at the other side, so to say, let's say, which is extremely powerful. What what is really this latent space telling us? Or simply speaking, right, there can be a PDE, but this could be a completely useless PDE, um, right? Because the latent space transformations, how do we get to the latent space, is already capturing all the interesting stuff, let's say, right? And so how do we make sure that this PDE makes any sense, so to say, at the end of the day? That's somewhat like my broad question. Yeah, I think it's a very good question. Um, but I, yeah, I think um, it, I mean, even if you have a very, very expressive encoder decoder, you still want the representations that you create to transform in a proper way, right? So you still, you still have some transformation um, and you're just telling it, I don't want you to be completely invariant if I transform the input. I want you to transform in a particular way. Um, and so it seems hard to, yeah, it, it, it seems to, there, there's always some signal there to try to, you know, to, to impose structure on what that dynamics then should be in your latent space. But maybe I'm not completely understanding. Um, do you have in mind that there are sort of solutions to this problem if you have no, an infinitely have solution. complex? So uh, probably as, as uh, so uh, um, as a background, so we did something similar, not with PDEs, but some other temp dynamics in the latent space. This was also like a, a robot application and uh, where we had the dynamics in the latent space. And what you could see then is essentially that I mean, you have all kinds of issues in this latent space that you have like redundancy, redundant features, for example. You might get rid of this, right? And uh, I mean, nowadays it would potentially be called disentanglement, right? You try to learn like uh, 
disentangled features and all these. So this was somewhat like an issue uh, in, in this work we did, that the latent space is somehow not really capturing in an intuitive way what we would like to see. And I was, mm. was just wondering, how can we do then a PDE in this space, right? Of course, it heavily depends what encoder, decoder architecture we are using, what other kind of uh, constraints we pose on. But yeah, that, that's why I'm asking this question, because we have yeah. these issues uh, in this kind of application, essentially. Yeah, so I think what, one potentially interesting observation is that the, the disentangling is sort of defined by the uh, sort of the, the, the capsule structure that you create. So in other words, the, you disentangle the space into sort of subsets of neurons that sort of transform that want to transform in the, you know, independently of other neurons. And, and, and that way sort of, you know, the, you sort of break up the space into, into independent pieces. It's maybe not statistically independent, but it's more like, you know, they transform linearly independent under transformations. And that's a pretty strong signal, I think, for the, for the latent space to, to break itself up into uh, sort of disentangled representations. Now, I'm I'm just wondering whether there is a solution that you had in mind where you, let's say let's say you have an infinitely powerful encoder or decoder. W would it would it go to a solution which is trivial in this sense, right? So that that's the main. Exactly. This is what I'm asking, and uh, I don't know the answer. <laughs> this is why I'm asking. Um, uh, well, I, I if you I if you that, right? um, well, if you impose that this that there should be equivariance, in other words, that there must be transformations and not just invariance, I think, yeah, um, yeah I know, I, I, I would have to think about it more, but I, I would think it will always find something to transform the input. Friends, if you rotate something 90, yeah, I guess you could you know, make it completely invariant, but uh, yeah, and anyway, I think at the output, things will have to transform. If you do a second like image segmentation, the output, it will have to transform. So if you only have invariant things, it will, it will not transform at the output, so. Yeah, but it's a good question um, to think more about it. Thanks a lot. Uh, Till, you raised your hand. Yes, thank you. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, I was curious, uh, do you see applications of PDEs in a similar fashion as done with uh, neural ODEs? And if so, like what kind of applications or what kind of challenges are in the way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you can think of a neural ODE as an infinite depth network. You can think of a PDE as an infinite width, infinite depth network in the sense that um, you have now a continuous space, let's say two-dimensional or three-dimensional space. Um, and, and you also have a continuous times time. So I guess at some point you have to put nonlinearities in there and stuff like that in order to make it powerful. But you, so I think PDEs, you can, you can think of, you can define neural networks and we actually did that. We have something called a, probabilistic uh, numeric CNNs, which are basically of this kind, where you define a neural network uh, basically as a PDE, which evolves through the layers. And intermittently, there is some nonlinearities. Um, and that way, you get rid of details of the discretization. You become independent of how you discretize your input, because basically, the solution is to first fit the Gaussian process to your points, make it continuous, and then and then pro, you know, have a PDE defined on that uh, Gaussian process. And we even took that one step further as we, we turned that into a quantum model. So it, we, instead of using just a Gaussian process, we use a quantum field and then say, okay, let, let's, let's go crazy. Let's see what happens if we do that, right? And so you basically get uh, a quantum circuit if you do that. And it's, it's a particular kind, it's kind of like optical quantum circuit or photonic quantum circuit. Um, and you know, in principle, this is more powerful uh, if you can run it on a quantum computer and if you can map it on an actual quantum computer. And of course, but on a classical computer, you can only do things which you can actually reasonably compute um, in that. But I think that that's a very interesting field to further develop because there are certain priors that you put into that construction. You're saying, you know, my input is like a two-dimensional field of some kind, and it's it's smooth and it's continuous, and you know, there's also it's it's uh it's you know, it 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 must evolve under you know with a second order, a third order, whatever PDE, and that that's a huge set of priors you put in in there, and 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 then see what happens and whether that's a good prior or not. 
And where do you see applications of this? Like from the science point of view, you mentioned quantum mechanics or? Yeah, so this particular way of doing things is, um, to, you know, to me, it's more like if, I ha if I'm trying to model something where I don't have a huge data set, and um, if, I have a, if I have a massive data set, I can learn everything. But if I don't, if my data set isn't that large, um, I, would, I would have to put priors on this network. Um, now, you know, you, you could imagine something like that to be interesting for medical image analysis or something like that. Um, because actually in medical image analysis, people do use a lot of, you know, they, they do describe images often with PDEs. It's very interesting. Um, and so here you sort of have a PDE, but you sort of embed it or sort of dressed it up as a neural network and you and, and sort of it's, it's, it's very similar in a way. Um, yeah, whether there are other applications. Uh, yeah, so you could imagine, so right now what we do when we try to do, so when we try to numerically solve a PDE, we, we using you know some kind of general network, but wouldn't it be nice if the model that would predict the solution of a PDE would itself be some kind of PDE network. So it, that could be a very good bias to, to produce the solution of another PDE. But anyway, I'm, I'm now just fantasizing. Um, I haven't thought too deeply about what kind of applications. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks as well from my side. Last chance to ask questions from the public audience. Okay, then I have to look at the watch. I guess it's also then time to stop the, the public session. Thanks again, Max, for the very nice uh, and inspiring presentation. Thanks everyone who joined online in the YouTube stream and also in the Zoom session. And yeah, I would love to ask the PhD students to stay here and the remaining people to leave the call, please. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>